conducted in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. It's Bonds versus Equities. I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities and joining me on the show tonight, I have James Gerrish from Novus Capital and we have somebody who might be stuck in traffic. So feel free to give us a call and talk about the bond market or the equity market on 1300 30 34 35 and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Tony will be with us in a second, I'm sure. Um, hello, mate. How was your week? Yeah, good. Very nice, Mike. Uh, is, is markets busy for you guys at the moment? And mainly you're an equity house, so Certainly, how's yeah. the market been treating you? Yeah, it's, of course it's busy. We're in reporting season, so yep. there's, there's a massive amount of things going on. Reporting season so far, the trends have been pretty pretty interesting. Overall, it's probably been a little bit lacklustre, yeah. but probably not as bad as, as most people had feared going into it. In, in a reporting season, does that mean you're busy you know, assessing the reports? That's clearly that's what you're doing. But what mm. do the customers do? Do they sit on the on the back or, or do they see where Farmers comes out with a good number and they jump straight in. Or how, how is the the tone of the clients? There? One of the one of the I mean one of the interesting things. You're obviously looking at the the actual numbers that they've delivered in the past, but you're more focused on guidance going forward. What the company's yeah. got to say in relation to their, what they're expecting in the in the numbers going forward. So that's where our main focus uh, is on going into the reporting season. You want to position portfolios more on the conservative side. So generally yeah. speaking, you have a little bit of cash in portfolios, so not sure. 20% so that you can take some advantage of if there is any <laughs> opportunities uh, for reporting find that, season. Do you find that in that reporting season, the forward guidance, and I mean, I'm thinking more about how mm. we've got the, the Treasurer comes back and says, hang on, budget deficit's a little bit wrong. And <laughs> I get, you know, that's forward guidance from Treasury. Yeah. How comfortable do you feel with these these organisations? Because I remember there are some that come out and consistently get it wrong and, and they have to then come back to the market and say, look, slight error on that one. How comfortable are you with their forward guidance numbers? Is that just form? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a company has a history of guiding well or a, a history of guiding poorly. Yeah. Uh, a, company, a lot of companies don't offer forward guidance because they don't have a lot of clarity going forward. I mean, when you put positioning portfolios, you want to... I guess target businesses that have a lot of clarity about earnings going forward. So different sectors have different, I guess, expectations or ability to project going forward. So someone like a West Farmers or Woolworths, uh, a lot of the banks, yeah. they've got really good expectations or a really good view on what's going to happen in the next six to 12 months, etc. Some of these other guys, like the mining services companies, the resource companies generally, there's not a lot of clarity in there and because you do have a lot of earnings volatility in there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very hard to predict what China is doing, what sure. China is going to grow at, and what the demand for commodities is going to be. I, I, I get all that. I, I get all that. I just mm. I find it curious. You know, the banks. How did you find in general the banks reporting? How did that seem to you at the moment? Well, CBA was the only one to report. The others gave um, ANZ gave the, a trading quarterly. Yeah, yeah, gave a trading update. So I mean, CBA was a great number. There's no yeah. there's no doubt about it. And I think one of the things with 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 the banks going forward is what are the, what are going to be the drivers for bank profitability going forward? Have yep. conditions for bank profitability improved or have they deteriorated? And I think there are signs that the underlying economy, things are improving over there. So, I uh, sort of, I was looking at the, uh, the reason why I ask about ANZ comes out and said, listen, we've got compression on the margins and we'd get better give you an update, mm. which was a surprise. Yeah. yeah. And then the NAB comes back and says, so listen, by the way, we've been selling some products we probably shouldn't have sold and we've just, you know, announced last night we're going to have to make some paybacks and, Bank. Yep. you know, yep. that, that insurance pieces. So I, 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 I get it. There's just that volatility in the market at the moment. I, I feel that the, the market in general is uh, distrustful. I mean, would that well, be that's, a way I to mean, describe? that's the equity market. People are going yeah. to have to understand about when you invest in the equity market that there is going to be volatility. There's going to be some volatility around earnings. Yeah. At times, there is going to be some downside. But overall, history shows the returns of equities have been pretty pretty strong over time. So, yeah. I mean, you've got to understand what you're buying when you're buying equity. That's the the biggest thing, or, or anything. That's the sixty dollars that question. Isn't yeah, it? Exactly trying to right. get clients to to understand that, and, and we can talk about them later. But the the thing about ASIC putting out the report on yes, hybrids versus exactly. and and the, at the bottom of the saying there's hundreds of billions of dollars of in the equity market. Mm. There's 50 or 70 billion dollars in the hybrid market and we're really worried about the hybrid market and I was looking at thinking isn't it interesting how they're worried about that thinking they've got the other piece 
under control, which is the equity piece, which, you know, maybe they have, maybe they haven't, because mm. I'm still holding shares, so I couldn't get out. You know. <laughs> well, it comes down to, I mean, you touched on the hybrid investments there. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, there has been quite a bit of negative commentary around hybrids coming out on the back of the ASIC, yeah. I guess, investigation on them. The whole thing about hybrids is understanding what you're buying. You're not putting money, and a lot of people have been putting money in from a term deposit straight into a hybrid, expecting that the, the volatility is going to be the same or the security is going to be the mm -hmm. same. That's just not the case. But if you understand what you're buying and understand, I guess, the outcome or the likely outcome of holding these instruments and what they can do for a portfolio, and then have, I guess, the you know, irrelevant weighting in those type of instruments, yeah. that's the key. But how do you find that in terms of as, a, as, as the person selling the hybrid, how do mm. you get up to speed with all that different product? Because I think part of the, and that's, this is no criticism of anyone whatsoever, the stockbrokers have been selling the hybrids on the, mm. on the premise of how you said they shouldn't probably be doing it. That's what the, the ASIC has been saying. In, in a general sense, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not picking yep. on one person. They're saying these are like, you know, you come out of your turn deposit, which is 3%, and buy this hybrid ANZ at 320, let's go and buy that. And people buy it because it's ANZ. How do you get up the speed as a salesperson on the, the complexity of well, all this stuff? It all comes down, you've got to be adding value to your clients, and that's the only reason clients uh, will invest uh, in or take your guidance sure. on, on investments going forward. So in relation to, I mean, the hybrid space, there's a whole raft of, uh, hybrids out there, we write pieces to in layman's terms about what you're actually buying. Yeah. So an ANZ hybrid is going to be different to a, an ANZ subordinated note. It sits differently in the capital structure. It's, it converts to underlying equity. It can convert to underlying equities at maturity. You're probably going to have slightly more volatility throughout the, the piece. Yeah. There's some conversion triggers in That's there. That's right. So you, you need to understand that the subordinated note you're getting a lower return for it, but there's the West Bank at 220 and the yeah ANZ exactly which I don't know. I mean you've got to look at it from a relative sense. So the West Pack at, at 220 over swap compare that to an ANZ subordinated note that was already issued at 275 over swap about six months ago. Now my expect my my um, view there is you would have been better to buy the ANZ on market than going through the broker book build yeah. um, to buy the West Pack. A lot of brokers would probably say. Would, would push the, the West Pack. Yeah. Exactly, exactly right. But you've got to look at it from a relative sense and what's clearly going to be the better return. Uh, yeah, that's the challenge. I mean, I think for us it's always been the over the counter versus the exchange traded. And, and often you'll see uh, the NAB caps are trading at 300, and mm. the NAB caps were a, an old issue, it's, it's an old structure. It doesn't have the equity kicker. It has the, yeah. you know, it'll go well, up in yield if they don't call it, but it, clearly everyone thinks they're going to call it because of the fact that. ASIC has said, we don't want these things out in the market anymore. Yeah. And I think to some extent, ASIC makes a rod for its own back while it tries to get clarity. Mm. And we can talk about this later on about the policy makers, because policy makers are trying to give clarity in everything. So let's say ASIC says, I want to give clarity in hybrids, and I want everyone to understand mm. exactly what they want, because I don't want to have the complaints from the investor that they didn't understand. But it's very hard to give clarity. Well, I think they've done one important thing is, uh, I guess, standardising the structure of bank hybrids that are, that are offered that contribute to Tier 1 capital, standardising the structure of the Tier 2 subordinated notes, yeah. etc. So when you see a bank hybrid come to market now that's a Tier 1 issuance, yeah. the structures are the same. So if you've had some experience or you, you look through the, the first couple and haven't taken them up, you might look at a, a, at a new one coming out and you've got, a, I guess, familiarity or around the structure and, and you can make a more, I guess, educated decision. And, and a lot of the documentation has changed as well, so yep. it has been made a lot simpler. I was looking at hybrids through the through the GFC and we had a lot of success looking you know, at hybrids that had been sold down through the GFC, but yep. the, the documentation around those, those through the GFC or those ones that were previously issued were quite complex, so you needed to spend the time yeah. to go through it and well, really, the, really... The case important was in today's paper about paper links. Paper links as a yeah. hybrid versus paper links equity, the, the fight that's taking place, who owns what, well, and they're saying, I've got a document that says I, I'm in this position, I'm shareholder, I say I'm in this position, and it's, and it's, to your point, it's created, it's so complex, you shouldn't really be playing in that space. Well, it's, you're, you're going to see the same uh, play out with, around the guns, guns hybrids yeah, and, absolutely. and guns equity. So, I mean, it all comes down, it really does come down to understanding what you're holding, and, and hybrids aren't a, a, a in exchange for cash, or they're, they, they're not um, you know, in exchange for a bond. I think hybrid should be in your equity allocation. Um, subordinated notes should probably be in the equity allocation. So it's all about having, you know, allocating a portion to ASX listed mm -hmm. securities, whether it be equities, uh, you can have hybrids in there, you can have subordinated notes in there. There's a lot of ASX listed bonds that have been doing 
quite well over Absolutely. the last uh, over the last you know. We'll few chat years. some more about these horrors mm. after the break. We have to leave it there for a very quick break. This is the first for the night. If you feel like giving us a call, please call one three hundred thirty thirty four thirty five and the email your money at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities, and joining me tonight is James Gerrish from Novus Capital and Tony Brennan, who's now in from Citibank. Um, they're here to answer any of your questions, so f feel free to pick up the, the phone, one 30 34 35 the email your money at skynews.com.au. Um, we'll get back to the hybrids because that was always good fun, but now that we have you here, uh, Let's talk about you know the world of Citibank and and how things are with you guys at the moment. Has it been busy? Is it an active market for you in the reporting season? That'll keep yeah. you pretty active. Well, reporting's very busy because you've got uh, all the companies in the markets either uh, publishing their full year results or yep. interim results, uh, and they come daily. You often get you know. 30, 40 a day at this stage, and it runs just for the month of August primarily, yep. some in July. Uh, so that's keeping everyone busy, just keeping up to, um, to you, date with Do things. you get to have one-on-ones with the organisations? If, they, if they're doing a reporting season, they've, they've come out, West Farm has come out, do they, do you, are you on conference calls and get the chance to question them about everything? Or is it, or, and do you put the questions in advance? Or do you, can you catch them out when you've got some concerns? How does that play out for Citibank? Is there well, they do conference calls with the yeah. shareholder base and the investment community after each result, so anyone, I guess, can dial into those. And who, jump on and ask questions. Well, who, who's they're not, they're the most impressive? Pre, you know, pre, when, uh, when, um, when uh, you've got BHP on the line, are, are they an impressive organisation? Like, what stands out as the ones who carry themselves best? Yeah, I guess it's this the, is a question out of left field. I'm sorry about that one. It right. sort of popped into my head. <laughs> well, I've, t to me, one of the one of the most impressive guys that I've uh, listened to has been in the ref from um, uh, CBA. I mean, he's he's extremely impressive. Mike Smith from ANZ, impressive. Um, uh, on there from BHP, equally so. I mean, these guys know how to, um, I guess, articulate their business and, and also um, bring it down to a level that, I guess, uh, others can understand. I'll be honest. I, I do talk to some you know, big fund managers um, in the equity space just to mm. chat and keep up with their just friends. You know, you've been around forever. You're, I'm, I'm older than I look. Um, and... That's a constant theme. Ian Arev at the CBA, they always, they all say, gee, he's an impressive guy he, because he's really down to earth at the same time. He's on top of all those businesses. And when you look at something like the CBA, it's like, it's a massive organisation. It's like a Titanic, you know, just, mm. can I see a, a, a big iceberg in the horizon? He can generally see it, they think. So, you know, he's quite an impressive guy. We have our first caller. Um, we have Sue from Wollongong. Hello, Sue, how can we help you? Hi, Mark. Thanks for your program, by the way. It's always enjoyable and informative. You're talking of CBA, got a question there that James might want to um, take up. It's around... I've got a modest holding in the Pearls 5 and Pearls 6, but a much more substantial holding in the CBA shares. Mm -hmm. We're just wondering on a bit of an exploratory discussion on the comparison between those holdings and whether it's worth offloading the, the Pearls 5 and 6 and consolidating in the shareholding when that price might go down on the, into the 60s more for the, for the ordinary shares, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, there are great questions, Sue, and of course James is going to say, look, I can't give you direct advice because he doesn't know enough about your portfolio and he'll, he'll be worried that you'd say that and Tony will be saying, oh my God. Um, but in truth, mm. at a macro level, how do you find the, the idea of shifting out of some of these assets back into the, the equity or vice versa? Do you feel that now's the time to move out of some of the riskier, which is equity, so like some of that lower, or, and move up the capital structure? or? What's your concept? It all comes down to it, it all comes down to what they're, what they're trading at at the time. I, you know, from a general sense, from from clients that I deal with, we often hold ANZ Bank, for instance. We also have ANZ Capital Notes, or we have some ANZ Hybrid. So instead of saying allocating, you know, it might be, you know. A portion of the portfolio directly in the equities, you also hold a, a hybrid or a subordinated note, so that you get obviously the income there, but you get less volatility, and that's what this this person yeah. is is they're holding now. Well, so Sue's in right. relation to whether to switch into the uh, equity or, or sell out of the uh, pearls into the equity, um, I think CBA from a valuation point of view, great company, great um, story going forward, great management, etc. But I couldn't justify it from a valuation sense at the moment. Two times eight. It, it's certainly got a topish book, feel. Et it's yeah, certainly I got mean, a topish feel about it, even though they are a fantastic organisation. Yeah, compared to the rest of the world, 
they're you know getting close to the, are they the number one bank compared to the rest of the world is that what it would be those metrics most expensive okay we'll, yeah we'll call the world's it most expensive bank so i guess if you if you if that's a justification the world's number one bank then you're probably accurate Could but i mean i'd be waiting till the equity market does have a hiccup and then i'd be allocating money out of those hybrids and going into the equity to buy that and equally so if the equity market continues you know unabated to 53, 54, 5500, which it's got, you know, it's got a good chance of doing, then you might like to you know, ease off your CBA holding and, and look for other debt-like instruments that are offering better value. Um, we've got another caller that's running hot. Brendan from Sydney. How can we help you, Brendan? G'day, Mark. How are you going? Um, look, I'm, I'm 26 years old. Uh, I currently have an um, equity portfolio valued at about $40,000. Now, I don't know much about bonds at all, but I was just wondering, is there a role that bonds would play, given my age and, and my sort of aim, I guess, to grow capital growth over time? Is that something that um, I should be looking at? Um, broadly speaking, we would say at FIG that, that you're probably on the younger side of the bond market. So we'd say you'd be looking at growth assets and take the volatility of equities at, you know, at, at that age. The only other caveat I would make on that would be that last week we had Stephen Nash and he was on the he was talking about zero coupon bonds he mm. was saying that at that age you could do a capital protected product by buying uh, a, a treasury corp of victoria zero coupon bond for twenty five thousand ten thousand whatever it might be dollars and then that over time doubles in value and you get a hundred dollars back if you pay 23 and in terms of a, a younger person you might want a portion as a capital protected but but young people would generally want to be in more growth assets. Would that be a fair thing to say, Tony? I think that's right. But although that's true, you know, that generally some diversification is good. So to have some mix of assets rather than just a concentration because they, uh, they moderate the risk. So, for example, like in 2008 when the stock market fell more than half, yep. having bonds would have lessened the blow of that because bonds rallied. Yep. Uh, so Tony, that, you can come next week. They do mitigate. Worry. They do <laughs> mitigate some of these risks. And in fact, if you want to take an extreme scenario, you can have uh, in some countries you have um, nationalisation risk and regime change risk hmm. when a market a stock market can fall altogether and not recover. Absolutely. For a long period. Yeah. So there's always that risk of being too concentrated. And it's just a question of where you are in your investment cycle. We've been talking about sequencing risk where as you move out of the retirement phase, sorry, move into the retirement phase, but you need still capital growth, but you need to have that consistency of income and you can't take that volatility. But if you're a young man with $40,000, you could probably take some volatility in income mm. and income and say, look, but, but the key, I think, is, is just that education, understanding all those different asset classes, understanding the stock market. Don't go and have a cup of coffee with somebody and say, buy this, this really good penny dreadful that's going to double. Mm. Do more time around, you know, reading some notes that people would put out and getting familiar to, with who you like as a, an analyst. That, that seems to make some sense and to me. And think about the earnings stream you're buying. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, it comes down to what does the company do? Can you envisage that co that company to be doing the same thing, yep. you know, earning more in five years' time? And if that's the case, then you'll do well out of so, it. So, Tony, speaking of earnings, how do you see earnings going? How's the PE growth? What's the drivers of the economy mm -hmm. going to look like for the, for the you know upcoming year or so? How, yeah. how does it seem to you? Well, we're, we're just get, we're getting all the fiscal 13 earnings now for the majority of companies. Some of them are on December year end, so that's later. Mm -hmm. uh, the earnings for the year just passed are, are basically flat to down a little for the whole market yep. because the resource sector earnings fell about a fifth. For the other three quarters of the market, the earnings are up about 6-7% it looks, which mm. is not spectacular, but given how subdued the economy is, uh, that's not a bad outcome. Uh, and I reckon a continuation of that in fiscal 14, which we've just started, um, is likely outside of resources and we could get a bounce back in resources. So the current expectations are for more growth of about 10%. And I think at the moment that's not unreasonable. That would make it an above average year. OK, I, I want to talk to you about that after the break. We have to go to another short break. Please feel free to give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 for any questions you have on bonds or equities or email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Bonds versus Equities, Your Money, Your Call edition. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Security. And joining me tonight is James Gerrish from Novus Capital and Tony Brennan, who's from Citibank. They're here to answer any of your questions. Please give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 and the email your money at skynews.com.au. Uh, Tony, before the break, we were talking about how it was a, a modest uh, earnings season based by the drag of the miners. Mm. But you think in the, looking forward 2014, you think it'll be more robust. And I was trying to understand why do you think, what, what do you see as the driver to make it more robust? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty that's got to be conceded. But Disclaimer. Yeah, you, you end up, after the big fall in resource earnings, some bottoming out is, yeah. a, is a real probability. and going into the next couple of years there's a, a lot of production growth that the companies are looking to deliver on the back of all the investment they've been doing for the last three or four years and that's in both mining and later in in gas lng and the the extent of this is quite large so that production growth should drive sales and provided we don't see another fall in commodity prices and keep in mind we've already had some pretty big declines over the last uh 12 to 18 months yeah. For example, um, in coal and iron ore in particular, as long as those prices stabilise for a while, sales growth will be will be good with the production growth. The, the other thing is the companies, because they've been under pressure, they're re heavily focused on costs, and the cost savings they're announced through these recent results have been very large. I want to talk to you about that. I want mm. to talk to both of you about that because I actually agree with you. I, I, the uh, uh, not so much Rio, I'm not sure about Rio, but, but BHP has come out saying we are going to cut, cut costs. Mm. I know you can't talk about specific stocks. Do you feel comfortable that when they say that they can do that? Do you feel that they're going to be able to deliver those sorts of the mining companies say we're going to cut costs? Do you think they're going to be able to deliver? Yeah, exactly. Change their behaviour? Yeah, I do. I mean, they've, they've developed a company throughout boom years when commodity prices were high, commodity prices have come back. They obviously go down and look at the, I guess, the fat in an organisation, and, and a lot of companies have a lot of fat there that they can get rid of when, when you know, when the, when the crunch comes. So, I mean, they've showed over the last six to 12 months, a lot of these companies have shown some pretty diligent cost-cutting uh, measures and, and, and to date they've done, done so pretty effectively. So you'd have to back them to do that uh, going forward. Um, I, I, was, I, I was dubious at the start when they said that and I am now completely on board. Mm. And the reason why was I went and spoke to some people at some of the mining companies, some of the big miners. And I said, how can you tell me, when you waste all this money all the time, that you now will change? And they said, Marius Klopp has taught us one thing, and that was discipline. Mm. And wherever he said we had to go, we went. And they said, now there's a new management in. When they say cut costs, we just we are disciplined business people now at, at all levels of the organisation. That sort of makes sense. You look at, yeah, you look at all the mining companies globally, and they've all had a change of CEO. You've, you've had these CEOs that have been build at all costs, develop at all costs, yeah. ramp up production at any cost, and now you've got, they, they've gone, they've, they've, they, that has now, I guess, They're to some degree, hasn't, some nice place. Has, hasn't worked, and they've got new guys in there who are very diligent on costs, who are going to concentrate on I guess optimising the production that they've already brought online, uh, and they're, they're going to, I guess, concentrate on less, I guess, de le you know, developing less in the future. Obviously, commodity yeah. prices have come down. One of the guys that you need to listen to is Ivan Glassenberg, the Glencore Extratus. But he's CEO. lost he's a lot of money, hasn't he? He bought I the wrong, paid the wrong price? Or yeah, it's yeah, but that's, I mean, a mining company is there to grow earnings, and a mining company needs to continue to, to reinvest its profits in the growth project. Sometimes they get that wrong, and over the last five years, mining companies haven't been a great investment. That's, no. There's, no, there's no doubt about that. But if you listen to the mining companies now, less in the ground, more back to shareholders. I mean, you look at it from a mining services point of view, or you've got to, you've got to think about, well, the mining services companies have been a beneficiary of the mining companies putting money into the ground over the last trouble. five years. Now those guys are in trouble some shareholders, in, in my expectation, the ones that will benefit. Yeah. Um, Tony, when, when I listen to the RBA talk about the mining business, they're talking about the transition where the mining business is slowed down and the transition to the rest of the market for we need that product pick up in th those businesses. Uh, it's a challenge, though. It's not really happening, is it? Well, um, I think it's happening incrementally. Um, and this actually also re um, is relevant to the earnings growth because the as well as the rebound in mining earnings, which is a reasonable proposition, I think the growth in the rest of the market could even be a, a bit stronger as well. And, and the cost-cutting that we're seeing in mining is actually much broader than that. I mean, we, 
we estimate that over a third of the companies we cover at City, which is up around you know 170, 180 companies, have announced cost targets over a number of years, and that's actually increased through this recent reporting season. So a large number of companies have targets for cost savings, which will help earnings for them in the next year or so. But the other thing that's going to be important is the economy transitioning away from this focus on mining investment to broader growth. People feel the reaction, response to interest rates has been a bit slow, probably has been a little bit slow, but I think if you it's look at the last amazing. few months, well, I mean, house prices are up 7% <coughs> yeah. in the last 12 months. Home lending is growing very strongly, the home loan approvals very strongly. So, And, you know, most of the information we have there predates the rate cut in August. Yep. And so presumably things will carry on on the back of that as well. So housing is definitely picking up and uh, confidence has started to recover a little bit already. We've got the election that could see that improve more and uh, usually when confidence picks up, spending follows. Do you think um, the lower currency is the key to all of this? That in, in By that I mean if we get a lower currency, manufacturing is not safe but it's better. Um, education as an export, uh, tourism, th those sorts of yeah. industries then start to be able to create different types of jobs. Is that, is that the RBA seems to say that's the key to it, to get that currency down. Do you think that's right? Well, it's, it's an important part of it. I'm not sure it's the key, but it's a help, it helps because it makes the country more competitive. And so ultimately you should shift spending back onto our output rather than other countries' output. One, you mentioned uh, education, another area, tourism. There, there's, there's sort of parts, industries that can change quite quickly. For example, we've had huge amounts of overseas travel by Australians in the last five years. Yep. That could qu quite quickly slow down a bit and more people come here. So I think the currency is quite important. I don't think it's necessarily the key, but it's an important part of the picture. When you talk about the cost reductions that you're, you're conscious of, what does that do to the employment uh, comfort? If you like, you know, the, you know, cost reductions mean people lose jobs, and uh, and if they aren't losing jobs, they're either productivity gains means they work longer for less. Yeah. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think there's going to be unemployment problems, and therefore does that sort of create the contraction in the economy? Well, unemployment's gone up a bit already, from around five to five and three quarter percent, and yeah. uh, I think there is more uh, job uncertainty than you would normally get, even with that level of unemployment. You know, yeah, people which are is much normally great. Yeah, so m people are pretty a bit anxious, I guess, and that's probably causing them to hesitate with spending. Um, you know, provided the, uh, the growth does start to continue to come through in housing and people do start to spend more on the back of that with their wealth going up with house prices, which is quite important, mm -hmm. then, then the fallout from the job reductions in companies trying to save hopefully gets at least partly absorbed by this growth elsewhere and we don't see too big a fallout in the labour market. We will talk about the housing ATM after the break. We have to go to another short break. Please feel free to give us a call at 1300 30 34 35 for any questions you might have or email your money at skynews.com.au and we'll be right back. At skynews.com.au and we have our first email for the day. It's an email from Warren and he writes, Hi, would the currency market be a good place to be in today versus bonds or equity markets? What levels do you see these markets over the next 30 days? Is there going to be more volatility? Cheers, Warren from Melbourne. Um, Two-part question. <laughs> Will there be more volatility over the next 30 days? That takes me into September. Well, I think that's probably the most, the, the easiest question uh, to answer. Do you want to answer that one I'd, then? I'd say yes, there is going to be volatility leading into uh, September. Uh, Warren, Fed you should be under the bed at the moment for exactly. this because I think it's going to be off the charts. Yeah, I'd, well... I, I agree, there is going to be volatility, but I don't think it's going to be the volatility that a lot of people may be uh, expecting. Like me. Yeah, I mean, of course, you, 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 um, uh, a lot of people are out there thinking tapering is going to be a, a major, I guess, impediment to the market going forward. We're going to see volatility in currency and equity markets, yep. etc. We're definitely going to see volatility in bond markets as well. But when you look at the, I think, uh, until about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, there, there, we've only really seen that tapering has really come onto the table now. The unemployment situation is obviously a key element to whether tapering is going to happen. Unemployment, in my view, on its own wouldn't instigate tapering. If it was left down the uh, unemployment, tapering would happen in 2014. What we've seen in the last week and a half, the CPI over in the States has come up a little bit higher than 
uh, what some of the Fed members have probably been anticipating. There was, a, there was a lot of concern that around prices over in the US, there was about four or five yep. voting members of the Fed concerned about yep. that. The fact that CPI came at a headline rate of 2%, um, I think that's what brings tapering on the on the table. But I think it's going to be some type of token tapering, where uh, where it's you know asset purchases down from 85 billion to 80 billion a month or 75 billion dollars uh, a month. So, I mean that I think the market has been positioning for mm -hmm. over the last uh, over the last few months. Tony, what do you think of the next 30 days of volatility? So uh, essentially, my question is, how do you think September plays out? Oh, I think it'll probably be a bit volatile because we haven't got this FOMC meeting in mid-September. And we, at City, we think they will start to slow the purchases. Yep. Um, and that'll probably unnerve the markets a bit. I mean, they're already anticipating it to a mm. fair extent, and but there's always an element when the confirmation comes, you get more impact. So I've got a theme here. I, I believe that September will be volatile because of the tapering. I, I agree that it's probably going to taper, and I think that's around politics as opposed to just policy. Because you, you can't have the Fed chairman handing it off to the new chairman. They won't do it in October. You can't hand off it in the new year. And, and mm. not because you're worried about your legacy, but because it's probably bad policy for a new Fed chairman. Let, let's imagine it's summers, just for, uh, just mm -hmm. for the joy of the theatre. Imagine it's summers trying to start tapering. I mean, he would go up to the Congress. It would be, it would be very dramatic. Mm. And, and even Yellen having to articulate something that's such a dramatic policy, it's not good policy to leave a new Fed chairman who is, the, if you like, the titular head of the economy to be able to start that process. So I think that's why he probably goes in September. Mm. In the event he doesn't, it's still volatile because then they're saying, okay, well, when will he go? So now markets get skittery. And I suppose the last point I would make is interest rates have gone up in the long bond by a large percentage. So we're looking at the, the tens at, you know, moving over to 3%. They've still been buying 85 billion a month. They haven't started the tapering and the markets have moved against them. So my view is that the, the policy makers and the market are at a divergence. Policy makers say we're going to keep interest rates low and the market's saying, I don't think so. And so the idea that you don't fight the Fed is now proving to be the Fed's having a problem here. It says policy makers are both in England, Europe and the United States saying interest rates are going low and the market is proving otherwise. So I think that's a problem. I mean, then, what do you think about the Fed's capacity to keep these rates low? Uh, I don't think they can keep them where they were. They've already they've run off a bit now anyway. So, I mean, the market probably has in its mind that the Fed often ends up going earlier than they kind of made us think originally. You know, sometimes they just have to go when the economy Got to do it. moves in an unexpected manner. So the market's already started to price them moving earlier than they are. This is on interest rates, actually. Yep. Than they are sort of implying by the sort of projections they've put out there, and uh, I don't think the market will resolve from that unless the economy softens a lot, which doesn't doesn't look like it's going to happen unless some drama comes along in terms of uh, the Congress again. Which yeah, we do have to face again. The, 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 the debt ceiling. The uh, yeah. and and to Warren, your other point about should you be in the equity, the currency markets versus bonds versus equities? Again, we don't know enough about your portfolio, but. My my firm belief is no. I mean, I don't think you should be punting. At, at this point in time, punting currency is a, a tricky game because at the moment, if the if interest rates are high, the U.S. rallies. The mm. U.S. rallies because everyone wants to buy treasuries because they've got some comfort, and all of a sudden, how, how did you play that trade? I think that's just much more challenging unless you're a professional punter, I would have thought. Yeah, when I, when I, uh, when I left uni, I used to work for a currency uh, company that used to algorithmically trade. Uh, currencies and and they're the type of companies that you're I guess up against when yeah. you when you're an individual playing in the currency market so I think that the the the, uh, the odds are well and truly stacked against you when you're an individual in the currency market I guess the only time that you would have success with currencies is taking a longer term view on the underlying economy of a company and playing it through its currency I yeah. mean in relation to the US the US is going you know we've all just sat here and said that US interest rates are probably going to go higher the Fed is going to have a, a, a difficult time keeping those interest rates under, um, I guess, at, at depressed levels. So the currency is probably going to appreciate. So you buy things like QBE, who you know higher rates, well, they can go and buy. I mean, part of the problem with QBE was that they were getting low returns in their bonds, and now they're going to get higher returns. Yeah, it is. But we've seen one of the same. trends with um, this reporting season is that there's been a major theme with a lot of brokers out there pushing U.S. exposed stocks, your Brambles, your QBEs, etc. With QBE, it's got it's got some really strong 
drivers for that, that's going to help its profitability going forward. Bond yields, currency, um, uh, the lack of uh, any disasters that have that, that have happened. But I think what the market has done has got ahead of what that means for actual underlying earnings at this point. So, so price it is. Yeah, the expectation that bond yields are going to have an impact there, the expectation that the currency is going to have an impact, those are important things and they will have an impact. But I think the market has got got ahead of itself because it's the only pure play on those themes in the Australian market and it's the only liquid pure play in right. the Australian market on those We themes. have a call from Richard from Sydney. Hello, Richard. How can we help you? Thank you, uh, Mark. Look, uh, I do hope there's uh, some volatility does return to the market. James, uh, um, just about the CBA of Optech, it has been at a record all-time high. I mean, generally, a stock at all-time high can reduce at least uh, 20%, which would put it back to say around about $62. And Tony, I think I uh, read a report from uh, City uh, regarding West Farmers um, increasing dividend next year to about 205, then to 230, and uh, quite a lot of free excess uh, capital. Just uh, thoughts, fellas. Thank you. Um, in terms of individual stocks, Tony's not equipped to talk about the individual stocks because Tony wants to stay working. Um, but might, maybe you'd like to take both CBA and West Farmers, please. Well, in relation to CBA and your comments about stocks making new all time highs, well, that's a bull market, that's that's what happens. I mean, yep. stocks and markets make all, all time highs. So a lot of people and a lot of, uh, I guess, technically focused chartists out there will offer trading systems that you buy on a break out of a new all time high and follow it with a right. you know, with a trend following system. I mean, that, that strategy has, has some merit. So I wouldn't get overly concerned about a stock trading at all time highs if the earnings underpin it. In relation to CBA, the earnings are there. Um, in relation to its valuation now, it's probably a little bit stretched. You saw recently it, it um, uh, obviously came down from a high of 74, 75. It hit a high of 75 on the nose. Yeah, and then it came, and then it came back to, to 70 and then it got bought up again. I mean, my, my view on the market here and what stocks are going to do well over the next 12 months is a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. There's a lot of mum and dad investors who have, haven't been in the equity market since their experience for the GFC. They probably sold at the wrong time. They've gone to cash. They're now getting a reduced return in that cash and they're now starting to look at equities. What names are they going to go into straight up? They're not going to go in from a, a term deposit into yeah. a BHP, etc. So, I mean, they're the names that you'd be focusing on. And then we can talk about West Farmers when, you come, when we yeah, come we back from the break. We have to go to another quick break. We'll be straight back. Welcome back to the world of bonds versus equities and the addition of Your Money, Your Call. We're still taking all your calls. The lines are open, one 300 30 34 35 and the email yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Um, West Farmers, we, we didn't get a chance to finish the question, West Farmers. What's your thoughts on that one? Yeah, well, I have it in client portfolios. Um, pretty optimistic on the stock. I don't think it's, it's fairly, you know, it's fairly well priced at these current levels. The viewer is asking in relation to um, an increased dividend or a yeah. capital return. They are doing a, or they've tipped to do a 50 cents per share capital return at the end of the year. That's got to get voted on yeah, right. Pending shareholder approval. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I like West Farmers just because of, they're everywhere. You know, there's yeah, that, I mean, the, 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 the natural the, diversity in some of these big organisations. The classic conglomerate, and we don't have a lot of them in Australia. No, we have very few of them. Mm. Um, we're just going to go and talk about the, the US economy in that it re it's remarkable in its strength when its natural stabilises its crazy politicians. Um, the Congress is fairly dysfunctional now. We'll have a fiscal debate about the debt ceiling. Sorry, they'll have a debate about the debt ceiling and then that'll focus into a fiscal debate. Mm. Um, the sequester, the, there's all sorts of things that are naturally holding them back. They've got a Fed chairman that'll start, you know, in an hour, but he doesn't know. Uh, it's remarkable how resilient it is, isn't it? I mean, the, the US economy continues on. What's your thoughts on it? Well, I think the private sector is offsetting the public sector, basically. You know, if you look at the private sector, housing's now recovering. Uh, consumer spending's been pretty good. Job growth has held up quite well. And despite what the public sector and the Congress have done and trying to get in its way, it's it's just kept going. But it's really just been this year. I mean, if you go back a couple of years, it didn't have that private momentum because the housing sector hadn't... The, the totally construction... Turned. I think I looked at a data point. The, the construction sector hadn't added anything to GDP for seven years. Yeah. Mm. That's so a remarkable year it's turned, number. which is changing things. But, I, OK, I was looking at... Just before I came on, I can't quote the, the accurate number. But if 
in the US mortgage market, if you have a 30 year mortgage, it's gone from $500 to $700 for an average mortgage. Mm -hmm. Surely that's going to be an impediment. And thinking how that then plays out into the broader consumer and the corporate you know, cost of borrowings. Do, are you worried about that, the effect of that mortgage market? Looking at how the US mortgage market works, you can get a 30 year mortgage and then switch and get another one, just pay a thousand bucks. Is that a worry? Uh, maybe a little bit, but it'd be probably self-correcting because if the housing starts to soften, slow down, the bond market will probably rally, rally? and it'll come back down. Yeah. And I think the bigger factors there are pretty supportive. Like People now think prices are going up, which starts to change the whole psychology of that market when they were going down for five, six years. There's certainly a confidence about it, isn't there? Yeah. It, there's a, co a confidence about all those people in their markets that they are... Um, you know, we, we hear that in the property market all these guys are saying, I'm now making some money, I'm getting close to... In, I, I worked in California for three years. Mm. You ring people up and they say, I'm finally back to where it was. You know, happy days. You know, so there's... Yeah. And there's not that, not that desire to throw the keys through the mailbox and head off. They, they feel a little more mm. comfortable about it. Um, so, resilience in the uh, US market. We are going to go to another segment called Sue's Bond School, and hopefully you'll have that up for us, Jade. It's a, uh, a chart we're going to show you about capital structure and, and Jade's talking in my ear so I don't know what's going to go on. Um, what we want to talk about here in the Sue's Bond School is how capital structure works and I've taken some data points here. Please don't email in and tell me I'm all completely wrong. They're roughly, roughly right. Uh, covered bonds, uh, I, I got an array of different uh, assets. Covered bonds are the the furthest up the capital structure, they're the safest, they're placed against specific stocks. So you can see the return you get which is quite low. I took a five-year term deposit from the people at FIG and that was the best major trading bank five-year deposit at 430. So you get a yield of maturity, it doesn't move, you get a running yield at 430. But then I started to look at senior debt. That senior debt is the Westpac 2020s. You get just under 5% for Westpac senior debt in the market. The, the, the cash, the running yield, so the cash you're getting is about 644. I thought that looked like it was pretty good value compared to where term deposits were for a, a portion of your portfolio. And then you move down to the subordinated debt was 514 and 559. That's an AMP subordinated debt. The tier one hybrids was a, 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 a conglomeration of the different uh, hybrids around. And then you have the shares. And the, and the key here is when a company, if a company uh, goes under, you get paid out. So the, the, the in liquidation, the payment starts at the very top and it through, through, moves through to the bottom, to the shares. And so then, the applications of the losses work that you're, you're doing better if you're in the covered bonds. The key to all capital structure is working out, am I getting the appropriate return for where I'm in the structure? That yeah. seems to make sense. Exactly right. That's Sue's bond school. Sue's the, a, a lady that emails in and she <laughs> gives it to me if I don't get it right. So we have a regular bond school for Sue. So, Sue, I hope you're listening on that podcast and you enjoy it. Um, now, our next uh, our question was, uh, the, the fiscal and the debt ceilings and all that sort of stuff, do you think that they will work it out naturally? Uh, eventually. If the past couple of negotiations have been any guide, it'll go to the last minute. When does and it there'll start? there'll be a lot of you know, talk around it. When does it have to get renegotiated? Well, they have a, their fiscal years to the end of September. So I think over the next month or so they have to actually. So they have to get it done by September. They have to settle on a budget, I guess, at some point, and also lift the ceiling. So it's up for negotiation in the next month or two. You, are you surprised by how aggressive the, the Congress is at the moment about how they conduct themselves? Like they are, they've got worse. They haven't got better. I, I'm always surprised that Americans mm. who come to Australia to, to talk to us and you ask them what the situation is, and they just say our Congress is dysfunctional. And, has and, been and for you years. hear it a few times from people that are pretty uh, sensible, and you finally start to accept it. And 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 it's not like it's normal. Normally, it's not like that. Yeah. So the issues Obama's had are probably real mm. in his difficulties with the Congress. Unusual for a president to have those. Is it something to do with the lame duck president? Is that is that an idea that it's last term? I think term? it's to do with the fact that. They've been in such an extreme situation, you know, they've, they've had um, all the money to bail out the banking system, hundreds of billions. They never went uh, down the to the deficit people. Went into mass the budget went into massive deficit that they yeah. hadn't seen. Home prices collapsing, like it's been, as we all know, 
probably the worst crisis since the Great Depression, and I guess it brings out extreme responses. So okay. they've got these uh, right-wing Congress members that are pretty extreme. We're going to go to a very quick break. We'll be right back and talk more about the American crazies. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. It's Mark Todd from Fixed Securities, and joining me today is James Gerrish from Novus Capital and Tony Brennan from Citibank. We're in our last segment for the day, and I'm going to leave the floor open to these guys, and I'm quite nervous. Uh, <laughs> Low-hanging fruit. Uh, Tony, what, what's your thoughts? What's, what's the, thing that, the theme that you think is appropriate? I think when you look across asset markets, I think interest um, income is expensive. So if you look at bank accounts, the interest rates there are low. If you look at bond yields, they're quite low and they're rising, which causes the capital values to decline. If you look at shares, I think the valuations are more normal because as the world went bad over the last five years and interest rates come right, right down, shares didn't really follow because people were anxious about earnings. Yep. And as those things turn around, I think shares are looking better cheap. in relative mm -hmm. terms. Not cheap, but I think in relative terms, okay. they look better. Last time you come on the show, <laughs> uh, come on, give it to me. What are you? What's the low hanging fruit for you? Low hanging fruit. I'll give you. I'll give you three names uh, okay. for, for for stocks: uh, Oakton, OKN, uh, Vocus Communications, VOC, uh, and I think Lendlease as well. They reported today. Not bad numbers. I think they're a 12, 18 month play as well. So three numbers outside the box that you would generally have outside your West Farmers. What do those? Banks, what do those companies do? Uh, communications focus. Yep. Um, in relation to lend lease, obviously yeah. uh, con construction, etc. Um, and Oakton is a IT consultancy. Uh, been through the ringer in the last 12 months or so. Uh, cut a lot of debt out of its business. Has net cash on the balance sheet, and it's li likely to grow earnings quite strongly over the next 12 to 18 months. I, I mean, I'm not going to go and buy those, but I'm, no. I'm, I'm glad you've never <laughs> got them out. And um, but the the thing that for me, I'm of the view that uh, we are going to go into a very volatile period. I just feel that because of the, the difference around it. So I don't know whether I want to be buying anything. Um, but if I was to put some money to work, the Australian corporates, investment grade corporates, you can buy at around 6%. You know, that, that, that was a Westpac bond. I feel there's an element, regardless of, I understand what you're saying, you'll lose mark to market valuation. But if you can get 6% for a bond over the medium term, and you say, put the volatility to one side and I'm going to take that 6% mm. because that's the one I, one I want to live on. Uh, that seems to make some sense to me. And, you know, I tell everyone, buy inflation linkers. I looked at Sydney Airport is now at four and three quarters for the 30s plus inflation. So you're going to get close to 7% mm. for senior inflation linked bonds. The equity gives you five and a half. And, and I said on the TV, it was franked, it's unfranked. No, so it's unfranked, yeah. Five, they don't pay that, tax that, that they pay tax. I, just, I went and looked at the paper and went, how can they be franked? And of course, mm. I got that wrong. Um, it happens once. Uh, but the, the, that didn't make much sense. I'd go and buy that, I'd go and buy the linker. And so that's what I feel low hanging fruit is six percent. That's 6%. not either, is it? No, but I'm but I'm moving up the capital structure. I'm in a safer asset. I'm I'm hedged to get some inflation. I'm going to get close to seven percent, and my target is six. So I'm not. I'm certainly not saying put all your money into those assets. Mm. But I feel there's lots of volatility, so I'm going to move a little bit out of the equities. And I still don't. I still think you have to buy equities. You've got to have growth mm. assets. But I sort of think I might move out of the equity piece for some of them into more capital stable because. At this point in time, I'm getting six. Six months ago, I was getting five. I was trying to get five and four and, four and a half. Mm. So the penetration in the bond market is weak enough to say that you know you should have some of those in your portfolio. Just on Sydney Airports, they made a really good announcement uh, last week when they when they reported changing gonna, their capital we, structure. I know, but we're going to have to go. Thank you so much <laughs> to our guests, James. It's not because I want to stop you. James and Tony from Citibank, thank you very much. To all the viewers and the emails, thank you very much. Until next time, I'm Mark Todd from Peak Securities. Have a great night. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise